morning everyone, lecture number 3 by Grigoris Vaye, exploring high energy physics with jets. Hi, you get a sound right? Pretty well, yeah. Good. So welcome back. Uh, before I start, is there any questions regarding what we said last week or even two weeks ago? No? So uh, <coughs> again, uh, as a way to slowly get back to speed, uh, I want to start with an interlude. I guess starting with an interlude is kind of a paradox, but fine. Uh, the question is, well, it, it's a, a little bit as, as a reminder of something, and of some things I'll need, uh, I'll need at least for this lecture later. So basically what we did two weeks ago was defining jets and essentially discussing basic properties of topologies of final states in QCD. And this is mostly textbook material and defining jet definitions is textbook material since uh, more than 10 years, maybe more than 15 years. Uh, last week, what we did was essentially give uh, an overview of how to do on order, why you need to do on order calculations in QCD and how you technically do at least basic on order calculations in QCD. And uh, that's also, at least the part I covered uh, last week is also mostly textbook by now. Uh, so for this lecture and the next two, I'm going to use this and do something which is less than 15 years old, okay? Uh, and one thing I'd like to discuss now is the question, so I, I said at the beginning that essentially the, a jet is a proxy to a hard parton. And, and that is essentially what you should keep in mind, what everyone has in mind in terms of the concept. And, and that's back to what I said in lecture one. And uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit what differences there are between the two, besides the fact that assuming this is not that ill-defined. So assume you have, you punch, I don't know, you punch a hard part in a detector, or you start the, you have a hard matrix element with a hard pardon, what can happen bef between that pardon and, and the jet in the, in the end, okay? And so if you go back to the view I had at the beginning of an event where you collide essentially protons, I, I'm going to focus on proton, proton, proton collisions for now. Uh, so you do collide two protons. These two protons, from each of them, you take either a hard quark or hard blue one. Let me do it, this one to change for a while. Uh, this has a hard collision, and let me just assume there's a bunch of hard particles coming from there, and whenever one of the hard particles coming from there, imagine just at Born level, lowest order in perturbation theory, whenever something hard comes from there, a uh, high energy quark on gluon, you'd expect it to be a jet, okay? So imagine I have, I don't know, a uh, gluon on this side and a quark on this side. Uh, at some point, this should, this should blow into jets, and there's essentially in terms of, so you, you should think about it that way as this being a hard, this is a high PT, so there's a hard scale for your, for your process, and the PT of this, of this parton is of the order of the hard scale. I don't care about factors of two here. Uh, and essentially, between that hard scale and lambda QCD, there's a lot of physics that can happen. And the first thing that can happen is final state radiation, which means that uh, that's mostly what we've been concentrating on last week and probably even two weeks ago, uh, that these pardons can branch collinearly mostly. Uh, you can have all sorts of uh, initial state radiation. So you're, I I given the fact that your initial state is charged over QCD, it can also radiate soft particles or even hard particles. Uh, and these are essentially the two on top of finite alpha s corrections that I'm not going to discuss at least for now, uh, these are the two things which are potentially enhanced by large logarithms, at least in terms of QCD. And then once you've essentially brought all the logs that go from your hard scale to lambda QCD, these things are going to hadronize into, into jets. Again, something non perturbative. Well, this, this is something non perturbative. By default, these are expected to be treatable in terms of perturbative QCD, not the third. And again, given the fact that your beams, your colliding particles are charged, uh, charged under QCD, I mean here, 
uh, they will also tend to have all sorts of soft interactions with your uh, there's all sorts of in soft interactions with all the different bits and pieces of this event and this is something known as the underlying event okay uh, just as a side note, I mentioned it, I think, briefly two weeks ago, a proton proton collision rarely happens alone in a practical detector or experimental context, and so several proton proton collisions happen at the same time. So this hard collision is often accompanied by a series of softer collisions, none of them having a hard, by soft, I mean none of them having a hard scale much larger than, say, the proton mass or lambda QCD, and so this is something called pilot. So what I'd like to discuss here is essentially assume you start with a pattern of a given PT. All these effects are going to affect, say, the average PT of what you're going to measure in your jet at the end. Your jet at the end of the day, which comes here, has a certain PT. Which is different from the PT of the pattern at the beginning. Okay, even assuming there's no, uh, I'm not discussing finite alpha s corrections, which may make a little bit more difficult this question about uh, about uh, precisely defining partons. But in this context, the question you can ask is what kind of delta PT, which is PT jet minus PT parton, say PT zero for the initial, initial parton, what kind of uh, effect all these guys will typically have on delta PT? And the question I'm asking here, is I don't want a f precise exact answer. I want something essentially qualitative. What are, what are the relevant scales in the process? What are, what's the scale? All these delta PT are dimensional full quantities, obviously. Uh, what's the typ their typical energy scale? And what's their typical dependence on um, the main parameters in the process? And the main parameters in the process is things like couplings, jet radius, and whatever you can think of, OK? So I want you to fill all these blanks. Anyone has a guess for any one of them? Let's start with FSR, it's probably the easiest one. So what's the typical scale? I want a scale for each of those. That's the problem, that's hopefully the easy part. Uh, and then I want essentially their dependence on the radius. That should be uh, doable, at least for a bunch of them. Maybe not all, and optionally some other scale in the problem. You can think about color factors in here as well. So, final state radiation. Oh, and the sign, positive or negative. That's, that's also something relevant. So, final state radiation. How do you expect it? So, imagine I forget about everything here. I just have collinear branchings, run Pythia with just final state radiation, if you want. Well, how should you expect the PT of your jet to vary? Positive or negative? Do you expect the PT of the jet to be larger or smaller than the PT of your parton? Smaller, because you can just have, uh, take a quark, emitting a gluon outside of a jet. The PT is going to reduce. So this is negative. What's the typical scale of this process? There's only one scale in that process, okay? The only scale is PT. So this is proportional to minus PT. Uh, this is a QCD process, so you'd expect a factor of S. And then, again, if this has a certain color, you'd expect the same color factor as the, as the parton. If this is a quark, you expect a CF. If this is a gluon, you'd expect a CA. And now, what's the radius dependent? What's the expected radius dependence for this? So imagine you have a radius r here. What would you, how would you expect this dependence to scale with r? One over r. One over r? 
Yeah, okay. Indeed. It's, it's a function which decreases with r. But one of r is on the right-hand side. Well, if you want to compute this delta pt, you're essentially going to integrate over all possible gluons emitted outside. What's the angular dependence of gluons emitted outside? As a function of the angle, you're going to get a d theta over theta. That's the standard logarithmic divergence, linear logarithmic divergence. So this is going to be a lo there's going to be a log one over r in this case. That's the standard, say, d glab kind of collinear logs that you would have in, in this case. All right, initial state radiation. So now I'm trying to look into one of these guys here. Positive or negative? So the physics here is what can happen is sometimes one of my initial quark or gluon is going to emit a gluon, typically a gluon. That gluon is going to end up magically in my jet, so its PT will increase. So it's a plus. The typical scale of the problem here, again, this is just this is just the hard part of the process. The only the typical scale for these emissions is essentially the scale of the hard interactions. That would be Q, and Q is typically the same the same scale as PT. So this is again something which scales like PT. It's again a perturbative process. So there's again a factor of alpha s. Uh, the color factor for this is a bit more complicated because if the jet is a gluon, then guarantee, there's no reason to really believe that the emitter of this gluon, of this initial state radiation gluon, is also a gluon. So the color factor here is more complicated. Uh, essentially, more complicated the same way that soft gluon emissions we discussed last week are more delicate to handle than just collinear gluons. Uh, now, the dependence on the radius. Do you expect a log in here? Well, not quite. This is not a collinear gluon. By, by essentially, by definition, collinear gluons are all put into the final state radiation. And so these gluons are essentially emitted anywhere with potentially some, some weight across the event. But at the end of the day, over the size of the jet, the weight is a slowly varying function. And so if you, if you integrate a slowly varying function over the size of your jet, you should expect essentially something that scales like the area of your jet. You just catch something or you don't. So it's typically r squared uh, plus sub leading powers in, in r if you want. Hablonization is a bit more delicate, right? Technically speaking, it's uh, unknown. You don't quite know exactly how uh, hadronization will affect your jet. There are actually ways to handle this analytically. There are some analytic models, whatever that means, of, uh, of soft, of non perturbative QCD. Uh, there's in particular a model by um, Dukchitzer, uh, I would say Dukchitzer, Marquisini, and Weber, but I'm actually not sure about the others. Dukchitzer for sure. Uh, where they essentially try to make some assumptions about how the, run, uh, how the QCD coupling behaves in the infrared. And with that, you can, uh, you can try to infer some effects of non perturbative physics. Uh, typically, it's also connected with instant on physics in QCD. Uh, so if you, if you do this, at least you can, get this, you can guess the scale. Hydrolization is expected to be, to be proportional to what scale? Lambda QCD, yeah, lambda QCD put the mass of the proton, the mass of the pi, and any, any, uh, any, so some non perturbative physics uh, with uh, something which is of the scale, some scale, some hadronization scale, which is essentially of the order of lambda QCD. Uh, the rest is a bit more complicated, right? Uh, what you can actually show is that this is a negative effect. And it scales like 1 over r. And there's also a color factor. Typically, uh, you'd expect gluons to be more affected by soft physics like than, than quarks. That's, that's not uh, very surprising. Another event that you should 
be able to guess. Essentially, a gnawing event is something which is just going to throw some particles randomly in your event. And so, again, what sign do you expect? You add some soft particles a little bit everywhere in the event, so you naively expect a plus sign. Uh, it's again an imperative process. You'd expect some scale, let me call this lambda underlying event, uh, which is also of your own lambda QCD. And the radius dependence, if again, if you, if you throw some random particles in your event, how do you expect this to scale with the jet radius? Like R squared. It's the same, the same as the uh, initial state radiation. Well, if you want, you can put a pi r square here just to remind you that this is that this is essentially an area, and that would be the same for pi up. Pi up is just some completely independent, uh, some completely independent process. So you'll just get some scale uh, that goes like r square, and again lambda pi up would essentially be lambda QCD uh, times some number. And this is the number of pile-up interactions you would have. If you have 100 pile-up events, you would have 100 times more energy deposits than if you had one pile-up event. Okay? So the higher the multiplicity of collisions, the, the stronger this effect is. All right? So I'll leave this here. I will use it. Uh, I'll probably use one of them in, in what happens. That was just a a way to try and get back to speed. All right, so this lecture is essentially about getting to, uh, getting to the reason why we want substructure, what is this about, and the basic concepts. Why do you want substructure? How do you use substructure? And, and essentially basic points like this. So in, in a standard uh, the standard approach is essentially what I've put up there, right? Any jet is giving you a hard particle. And that's how jets are used in uh, 90 to 99 percent of uh, the jet, the, the LHC analysis. And since the LHC collides protons, in most of the cases you do need jets in the final state, if only to tell you that you have no jets. I don't know, even if you want to measure uh, some inclusive Z boson production where the Z boson decays to E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus, you'd probably somewhere impose a QCD condition on the isolation of your electrons, the isolation of muons, and that's to, re to, re to remove the jet background. So jets is essentially omnipresent in this context. And uh, with this, for most of the applications, you just run your NTKT algorithm on the particles you have, and you get your jets, and you put cuts, kinematic cuts on your jets. All right. So this typical, I don't know, I can give you, I had listed a few typical examples. Uh, yeah, I don't know. imagine you want to measure W plus jet events for, uh, that's a common background for BSN searches, uh, or you just generally want to measure, tune your Monte Carlos by measuring W plus jet events. Uh, If you do that, you'll just reconstruct a certain number of jets in this case. I don't know, imagine you take W plus 2 jets. Uh, you expect the bond level to be W plus 2 uh, quarks and gluons, and so on and so forth in perturbation theory. And that's how you'd say this is two jets corresponding to my two parents here. Uh, now, if the W decides to decay into uh, leptonic mode, you're fine. But if the W decides to decay in QQ bar, in this case, you'd expect this to give you four jets in your final state. Two coming from the decay of the W, two coming from the decay of your jets. And you're going to put kinematic constraints on your final state so that at least two of the jets are consistent, somehow consistent with the mass of the W boson. Uh, because just to differentiate this from the full QCD four jet events. Okay? Uh, I don't know, I can take another example if you do TT bar. If you do TT bar in a semi leptonic way, so the top can, well, the top always, uh, give or take, always decays into uh, W plus B, 
uh, and then the W can either decay leptonically or hadronically. If you have a TT bar where semi-leptonic means one decays leptonically, the other one decays hadronically. So this is going to give you W, well, essentially, other AW decaying to QQ bar, uh, AW decaying to, say, muon neutrino. So you would expect, in this case, uh, one muon electron, four jets, and missing ED. So some missing energy tracing the fact that you don't detect the neutrino from the leptonic decay, one muon or electron coming from the, double, the leptonic W decay, and then four jets including two Bs from each of the top decays, so two Bs from each of the top decays plus two quarks coming from, uh, from the W decay, all right? So in, in this context, you think about what typical decay you'd have, and you get your number of jets. And again, in this case, you'd impose kinematic constraints. You, you, you'd impose that at least there are two B jets. You find a way to tag B jets. Uh, I don't definitely don't want to discuss this. Uh, you'll find a way to discuss the fact that among these four jets, three are compatible with the mass of the top. And the fourth one, together with some form of missing ET and uh, a muon or electron, are compatible with another top. Okay? So this is really the standard use. You just impose a number of jets the same way you'd impose a number of, of leptons, or the same way you'd impose missing energy, transverse energy in this case. Uh, and you impose kinematic constraints on jets the same you treat jets as particles as if they were uh, as if they were uh, hadrons and the same the same story here you'd get sigma in background in a sense that in this case something like w plus two jets where some b tagging fails on the two jets or oh, yeah the, the w plus two jets would that do it no missing something uh, but something like even f yeah any process that gives you this uh, yes, yeah, so it's probably W plus four jets in this case would uh, would give you a background to this process. Okay, one W decaying to uh, mu n missing et plus four jets, and you want to impose cuts somewhere in your phase space and the properties of the PD of your jets or the separation in your jets in phase space that separates your TT bar from any other background in the process. All right. So wh wh what I've used in, a, in assuming this is that if you have a W that decay into QQ bar, each of these quark and anti-quark are going to give you a jet. And if you do the same for the top, the top decays into WB, the B, this one decays assuming into, into jets for the full leptonic one, and so that gives you one, two, uh, three jets, all right? Now the question is, What's the angle here? Or a similar question is, what happens if you take, let me take the case of a W boson. It's actually just two quarks instead of three, so it makes it a little bit more easy. And, and I don't have to discuss beat hanging. Uh, let me assume the case where the, when you start to increase the W, you, you start to increase the energy of this W boson. So it's PT in, in, in uh, a PP collider variable sense. In particular, essentially, I'm taking PT of the W to become much bigger than the mass of the W. What happens in that case? No? So let me just draw this back again here. There's so you have your W decaying to QQ bar. So this is carrying a fraction Z of the PT of the W. This is carries a fraction 1 minus Z of the PT of the W. And this is an angle theta. And this has a certain PT. What's the angle theta? So what we had last year was essentially that m squared 
essentially z 1 minus z pt squared t s squared. It's something we did exactly for QCD branching last week. It doesn't, uh, that's pure Lorentz kinematic. It doesn't depend whether this is uh, a massive particle or not. Uh, so in this case, uh, the angle is just m w in this case, that's the w mass divided by pt, and that's a square root of z1 minus z factor. So if you forget about the square root of z1 minus z factor for a second, this means that if we're in this limit, then this angle becomes much more than 1 or much more than the jet radius if, uh, if instead of taking this, you put uh, a factor r here. What does this mean in terms of jet reconstruction? If these two particles because become close enough, so this means that if you boost, if you start to increase the PT, at some point you're going to get in a situation like this. And so instead of having one jet here and one jet there, if this distance is much smaller than R, then you'll just get one jet. So this means that my... Uh, zero order assumption, or my conceptual assumption, which is a jet is equivalent to a hard parton, uh, which is essentially what's used in all these cases, all these uh, default cases, this assumption starts becoming questionable. So this is really the typical uh, the really the typical case that I'm going to discuss for most of actually the remaining three lectures uh, really the case of boosted jets and the question is now if you have a j well the question is now th this is essentially what you want to see okay imagine I want to find a w with a 1 TV, a PT, a PT of 1 TV. Uh, definitely, this is 8T divided by 1 TV. This is small, right? And so the question is now what happens? This now is going to be seen the same way as, say, a gluon, now branching into whatever you want, is seen as a jet, or a quark branching into whatever you want is seen as a jet. So in terms of, of what I was saying here, at some point you need to put cuts one way or another to separate whatever signal you want to see from a background, like TT bar from something like W plus 4 jet backgrounds, or uh, some BSM signal from some QCD or uh, W plus jet background. The typical way you would think about signal and background in terms of, uh, of most of the standard searches and measurements at the LHC, I don't know, Higgs to gamma gamma would have a background of just the normal productions of two photons or sometimes uh, mistagging of photons at the LHC. Uh, all these kinds of standard things now are essentially uh, do apply here, albeit now in a quite different way, in the sense that now you, what you want to do is say whether a jet is coming from something fancy like a W or is, is it my just common QCD jet, all right? So, uh, let me see if I, yeah, let me give this, uh, well, I don't need to give this. So the technique here is to say, I have an object, a jet, and I want to understand whether it's coming from, what is it originating from, all right? Quark, gluon, W, top, a Higgs decaying to BB bar. Uh, I'll give you a list later, but essentially the idea is you have a high PT object. A high PT object can now come from something different than my basic concept of saying it's a quark or a gluon. And so the idea here is just to say, instead of considering the jet as a fixed object, 
So the JET essentially, for all the applications I had listed here, what you're using is mostly the PTE of the JET, put a cut on PTE, or on PTE above 30 GV, 40 GV, something like that. You, you may want to use, uh, let's say, the rapidity and azimuthal angle of the JET to say two JETs, are, if two JETs are nearby, I don't know, if you want to make two to take two jets which build a top or a W, you may want to say I'm going to take two jets or three jets which are nearby in rapidity azimuth, they're most likely to come from the W. Uh, so this is essentially the kind of variables you want to use in order to build your standard cuts on, uh, on, uh, on jets. And it, it's exactly in that sense that I said that the standard use of this object is just to say you treat them like a particle. And a particle is a certain energy, your PT, in a certain direction in phase space. And you, so you treat the jet as a single particle, as a, as a single monolithic object. While in, in the case of, say, boosted jets, you want more. Because if you want to discriminate this, all these objects have the same PT, have the same rapidity, have the same azim azimuth. And so you need extra properties in, in terms of differentiating one from the other. And in this case, you essentially open, what, what you're going to do is look at the internal properties of jets. So you essentially exploit kinematic, internal kinematic And this internal kinematics is what's called substructure. So in a way, it's really trying to use the internal structure of jets instead of considering them as a single object in order to differentiate between these guys. All right? So there's, there's a list of applications. So substructure is a list of applications. Let me try to lose. There's obviously the one which is boosted object tagging. Uh, this is probably the biggest one. That's the historical one. That's the biggest one, and that's what I'm going to focus on mostly. Uh -huh. Through the years, it has actually grown into trying and, and discuss several other things. Uh, I'll try to keep my writing not too small, so I'll make the list. Uh, don't hesitate to complain, Marco. Uh, so, can anyone try and guess any other application? So, 10 years ago, that was, that was essentially it. Boosted object tagging, uh, end of story. Uh, anyone has another guess? Someone says BSM searches. That's essentially part of this, right? I'll, I'll comment on this uh, in, in a minute. Anyone? Edmond, you should know at least one well, item on that list. Okay. I, I, I'm <laughs> supposed to speak about that, right? All right. Imagine so the, 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 there's something uh, heavy ions have relied on this. Uh, even more than heavy ions, just measuring the speeding function anywhere. I mean, the rigid distribution is measuring the speeding function, right? It's a direct measurement of the speeding function. Uh, let me try to see how I fit that into the list I had. Well, yeah. Some QCD measurements and some of those hints towards precision. I'll briefly discuss this, but again, the idea is uh, essentially PP collisions are dirty compared to uh, E plus E minus collisions. If you remember what we discussed in the first lecture, PP collision has all these extra complications, these extra soft interactions compared to a clean quote unquote E plus E minus collision. So the rule of thumb is you build an E plus E minus collision to the precision physics, you build a PP collider to do discoveries high energy because it's easier to go to high energy in PP than in E plus E minus. And so PP are discovery, E plus E minus are precision. And by now, since the LHC is 
turning to uh, is showing so many new physics signals. Uh, the LHC is now trying people try to see is there any way to do some precision physics at the LHC and start trying to probe new physics in the precision measurement <coughs> rather than in a wild uh, uh, standard uh, PV kind of search where you would see a signal popping out somewhere in the middle of a desert. Uh, so in this context, uh, actually Substructure has proven helpful in terms of trying to do some precision measurements. Uh, and this is something I'll, I'll come back later. In terms of heavy ions, uh, again, it's something that over the last few years there's been a, a, a quite a gain of activity. I'll probably comment on that only briefly. Uh, there's all sorts of extra things, like Monte Carlo generators. Uh, essentially constraining or better tuning Monte Carlo generators, better constraining Monte Carlo generators. Essentially, substructure probes a phase space, uh, probes certain type of physics that might be interesting to, uh, to deal with Monte Carlo generators. And by this, I probably mean more all-order Monte Carlo generators, Spartan shower Monte Carlo generators, like Peter Herwig or Sherpa, rather than fixed order. Again, the idea here is fairly simple. You get a process which is at the scale here, which is PT large, and you get down to something here at the end of the day. This internal dynamics of jets is covering all the scale between a hard scale and a soft scale, and so probing the dynamics, that range of dynamics of scale is typically what a parent shower would do. I'm certainly forgetting, uh, forgetting a few things, uh, at least two. Let me see if there's not a more urgent one to discuss. Oh yeah, I forgot this one. Uh, there's something, and, and I'll briefly talk about this. There's something about pileup uh, mitigation, so trying to reduce uh, the effect of pileup. I'll talk about this later in the, the second hour of this lecture. And then there's probably two others I'd like to uh, mention here. One is machine learning. Yeah. And in a way, this sort of mostly belongs to boosting object tagging, but uh, it's grown to a point where it's probably its own uh, subfield or even field in a way. Uh, again, all these points I'll discuss to some degree. Uh, and probably another one which I can put here is, I would quote this as QCD fun. Uh, so the big thing I'd like to cover in details is this. Uh, and that's essentially what I'm going to do today is discussing the importance of this and show you a list of techniques, concepts and techniques that you can practically use, tools, real genuine tools, substructure tools, techniques that people have introduced to deal with this classification problem. What I'll do in the next lectures are essentially trying to get to this idea of slowly going from how can we understand these taggers in terms of QCD, and that's going to hint to precision measurements, I'll briefly touch on this, and to QCD fun, and by fun here I mean is that sometimes uh, by trying to make QCD calculations for these guys, for the, these, these tools, some strange QCD properties have, uh, have ar arisen, 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 uh, arose. Uh, and uh, one of these, what Edmond mentioned earlier, a way to measure the QCD splitting function by default is something, again, it's, it's, a not, it's an internal uh, property of QCD which is not supposed to be measurable in a way. So we found, people found a way to actually try and expose this QCD splitting function and that's, that's what I mean by uh, QCD fun. Uh, I probably won't talk much about Monte Carlo generators more than I, well, I, ju I just did, except maybe, well, there's a bunch of things like heavy ions and Monte Carlo generators. I'll probably discuss a few ways why, at least uh, avenues that could be used in order to, why people think it's, it's helpful. Uh, and pilot mitigation, I'll probably just briefly discuss in the next uh, 
<laughs> it's connected to something I'm going to discuss when discussing Boosty Tiger. So that's, uh, that's going to be it. All right? Any questions so far? No? So in that case, I have questions. So what I want to discuss now is the case of boosted object tagging. So imagine, uh, for most of the discussion, I'll take the case of a W boson, uh, because that's uh, the simpler way I usually like to discuss uh, the various basic ingredients at play. Uh, and there's a bunch of questions I like to answer. The first one is, do I care? Or do we care? Do you care? Do you have to care? Uh, and I can phrase that question differently. Uh, I've put you in a corner. In my corner, I mean corner of face space here. Uh, I've taken the case. I, I'm not taking about any jet here. I'm taking about a very specific set of jets, which are boosted jets. You may just say, I don't care. I mean, one TVW jets, who cares? Uh, so that's the first question. Do you need to care about uh, these kind of objects? Or can you say, ah, that's just for... Uh, that's a remote corner, I don't care. And I can still live with my standard use of jets. So that's the first question I'd like to answer. Uh, the second question is, uh, how do you, I, I have a classification problem. So I want to separate a W from QCD, top from QCD, uh, quark from gluons. Uh, you want to separate objects. How do you quantify uh, your, your discriminating power? What are the typical? What am I trying to achieve in trying to separate from one from the other? And the third thing, and that's the biggest one, the third thing I'd like to discuss is how do you do this? What are the techniques you want to do, you want to use? And that's probably why uh, that's the biggest chunk of, uh, of physics in these seven lectures. So the first thing is, again, you start with, uh, let me have a few examples here. So the question is, I have a signal versus background problem. And in terms of answering the question, do you care, uh, there's two aspects to the problem. There's, a, there's generally a question about the phase space that I was telling you five seconds ago. There's also a question of the system. What kind of uh, signal versus background problems can you, can you discuss? Uh, one is, as I said earlier, W, Z, or Higgs versus QCD, and QCD here is quark over one. And the reason, yeah, the, I'll get to this in a second. Another one is top versus QCD, and again here is quark over one. Any hints why I would separate these two? What's common to WZ Higgs and different in top? Well, think, think jet. Think standard jets. If you were to measure W0 or Higgs decay into jets, you would require two jets. If you were to measure tau going to jets, you would require three jets. So uh, essentially, these are objects where when they decay, they involve two QCD pardons. This is something which involves three QCD pardons. And I'll, uh, yeah, so essentially, one way to quantify this is just count the number of expected pardons. Uh, you could do other fancy stuff. I don't know, any QCD, uh, well, sorry, any new BSM particle decaying to QQ bar, any new BSM particle decaying to three quarks. I don't know, R party violating SUSY objects would decay into three quarks, for example. Uh, any objects decaying to QQ bar, QQ bar, I don't know, take the case of Higgs, uh, sorry, X, something decaying to two Higgses. And you can go fancy, right? You can have something that decays into six. Again, uh, typical case, X going to TT bar, going to six quarks. 
And there's a much more, uh, and again, the, the background is always QCD in this case. Uh, there's another case I'd like to discuss, is the case of a quark versus gluon. So there's a question of whether anything here is realistic. And I guess, uh, I don't know, Carlos, you probably can give examples way better than me of BSM models that give something like that. Uh, I don't know, W's, W's and top obviously you can pop up in BSM decay chains. Especially the top, because usually BSM particles are massive, and massive particles tend to cover more with top than others. Uh, so top is something very frequent in BSM decay chains. Uh, and so if the mass of the BSM is heavy, the top is going to be boosted. Uh, these things tend to be all sorts of probably more specific BSM scenario. Uh, this case here is also relevant for searches. For example, you tend to have a BSM, a BSM particle would tend to decay more into quarks than into gluons and vice versa. QCD tends to produce more gluons than quarks. And so if you can find something which separates quark from gluons, you have a way to enhance your BSM signal versus your QCD background. Uh, so at least all this is a list of applications. Uh, probably I think top, this, these are the most common ones. And, and quark versus gluons. Uh, these are more exotic kind of things. You see them sometimes you see searches like Higgs, Higgs to a, uh, to four Bs or something that decays in the decay chain, but the typical case are, say, the simpler ones. So that still doesn't answer the question, do I care about high PTW? Why, if I have a process that produces a top, why would the top? I think you are looking, sorry to interrupt, but I think you are looking also to this uh, uh, different X that you mentioned when you look to heavy resonances and yeah. produce and so on. And this is a, a large scale of yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in MCHM and other models. Yes, 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 yes. I agree. I agree. Uh, well, I think also this, these kind of things used to be the standard one. Uh, essentially, Susie, uh, I'm thinking Susie decay chains. Uh, if you look at all these others, X in that case would be more of an exotic particle. And in that case, since uh, the LSC is probably turning more into getting an open mind in terms of n not just looking for SUSY, but looking for BSM in a more general, modern, independent way. And in that case, I agree that these becoming, are becoming more frequent. Um, uh, although probably the lower the multiplicity, the more frequent. And by multiplicity, I mean number of quarks. Uh, mostly because if you want to produce something that decays into a huge number of quarks, yeah. you need it to have a very, a, a very high energy or a very high mass. Uh, and a very high mass plus very high PT, the, the phase space becomes a little bit uh, uh, not so boosted, if I, can, if I can phrase it this way. So that's also why, that's, yeah, that's, that's the other reason. Uh, so the question is why do I care about high PT? Do any of you care about high PT? And there's, there's two reasons for, for you to care about high PT. The first one is a QCD reason. The higher you go in PT, the more perturbative you are. So for all of you who are doing perturbative QCD calculations, that's gone. You have a huge phase space to discuss QCD before you start getting into non perturbative trouble, which is going to come and bite you and then make your 1% precision calculations have 2% uncertainty on some non perturbative physics. So, yeah, high PT is good in terms of QCD. And, and that's something I'm going to come back in terms of, uh, in terms of measurements in, in the future. Uh, but more in the context of searches, uh, as the LHC accumulates data and does more and more analysis, uh, what happens to the typical scale for new physics, if, if you look at the scales for new physics, tends to increase. Uh, if you look at the typical bounds you have now on BSM particles, you quickly get bounds which are in the uh, 
at least 500 GV, sometimes one or two or several TV scales. So if you have a BSM object that decays into standard model particles, you have a high mass objects decaying into lowish masses, and by lowish I mean typically W or top, if these lowish masses, if, if there's a big gap in the mass, then it means that the W and top are going to be boosted. And so essentially this is a one-way street. As the LHC increase, pushes these, uh, these bounds to larger and larger values, the case of boosted jets is becoming increasingly important. If you build a 100 TV collider, hopefully, uh, one day, give or take, everything is boosted. So all tops are boosted, all Ws are boosted, because you're not talking about a 1 TV top or a 1 TV W, you're talking about a 20 TV top or a 20 TV W. So in this context, I think this is the main reason why you should care about this. Mostly because you're inevitably going into a region where things are increasingly boosted. Uh, there's probably one counterexample. Uh, I don't know if you think about measuring low mass particles at the LHC, that's definitely a counterexample. And this is a case where these kind of things can, uh, can help, for example. Uh, imagine you want to measure low mass object. A low mass object, uh, and that's, that's a, I think an example, a great example. Uh, low mass objects can be produced boosted as well. Uh, take the, a typical search at the, at the LHC for this kind of particle X would be you pair produce them. And if you pair produce them with a high PT on both sides, if, if they're low mass, there's actually even phase space to produce them in pair with a high enough PT. And in this case, both their decays into QCD particles, whatever QCD particles here, are going to be boosted. And so you can look at digets, in a way, digest systems when each of these digests has, uh, has a, a small enough mass. And actually what, well, each of these digests, sorry, each of these digests has a mass compatible with the particle X. And so it turns out actually the, the boosted search for this, the search for this kind of, uh, of new particle is actually more efficient in the boosted channel than in the standard, uh, in the standard case. Uh, people now are able to go down to masses of, the, of, of this particle X that are a few tens of GeV. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I in terms of known, I would say, benchmark applications people have used in subtractor so far, one is exactly the one I said, X going to QQ bar where you can actually, using subtractor technique, go down to constraining x in a region which is very low in mass, while if you were doing that in the non-boosted limit where you have two jets, uh, the QCD background would just be too overwhelming. Another example, and that's something probably many of you will remember, it's the, uh, let me call the die boson. Access, so something at the end of the run one of the uh, LHC run one, uh, if you remember, there was this uh, kind of bump somewhere in the region about 1.5 to 2 TeV in the uh, diboson channel. So you search for two bosons, and again, one of the issues is that Atlas and CMS were not seeing them for, for the same combinations of Ws and Z. But I don't want to enter into these details. Uh, if you take a mass, an invariant mass of the two boson system, which is 1.5 to 2 TV, obviously each of the W is taking somewhere close to 1 TV, and so you're in the boosted version. So bringing this excess here is essentially relying on substructure to, to measure this. So again, this is a typical case where I said this is helpful for BSM physics. You do have something that couples to standard model particles, which are produced boosted, and you need to isolate them in order to get your signal. Uh, there's also lots of things in terms of Higgs to be bar uh, that I don't want to uh, uh, to enter too much about. But again, the, the s actually the first uh, LHC proposal for boosted jets was to try and uh, and measure low mass Higgs is going to going to be bar. So I think these are mainly mainly the uh, the main applications that probably many people have heard about. Uh, 
And uh, one of the things I'd like to do by the end of this lecture today is actually give you a hint of what people have done to try to get this, the real method that people have, have done to get this. Uh, yeah, I'll spend a few. Let me see if there's any. Yeah, I think this is this is all I had to say in this case. Marco, do you want to make a break now, or do you prefer to uh, make it in ten minutes? It's up to you. Uh, let's ma let's make it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can easily get carried away and then talk for more. It's very bad. Yes. So I'd like to discuss for a second. Uh, Tiger performance. So remember, with I'm just rewriting what I erased a second ago, you have a signal versus background problem. And the question is, how do you, it, it, people have come across 20, maybe 30 different methods to separate the signal from background, depending on system, depending on uh, lots of things. and. At the end of the day, you want to be able to compare. If I, if, I don't know, maybe these lecturers are going to inspire you and you're going to say, well, no one ever thought about looking into this. Maybe I should. You're going to come back and at some point you want to see, test your method. You want to be able to check whether your method, how does it compare to existing things in the market? And so the, the typical way people are, are doing this is generally by taking uh, discriminating performances. And so the typical quantity you're going to use is what we call a signal efficiency, which is give or, so you have a sample of, imagine I have a per, pure sample of signal and background jets, okay? Uh, the signal efficiency is give or take the fraction, well is, the fraction of signal jet So tag so you have a given method yes yeah, sorry I was going to extend this that should be the fraction of tag the signal jets uh, I want you to make a longer sentence but that's going to cut it So your method is not perfect, right? So if you throw it 100, imagine I want to do again. I'll take the case of W versus uh, Quang Gluon as the uh, go-to example. Imagine I take 100 different W jets. Uh, not all of them are going to be successfully flagged as W. Okay? So you have a method. The method tells you this jet is a W or not. Uh, so not all these jets are going to be labeled as Ws. So there's a fraction epsilon s of those which are going to be. Uh, conversely, there's a fraction epsilon b of tag background jets. So jets which are generally QCD jets, Q, quark, or gluon, but they're wrongly flagged as W-like by my tiger. Okay. So in that case, there's two things you can do. If you do have a, a tagger which, is, uh, which has some free parameter, and most of those do, you can actually just try to plot epsilon b as a function of epsilon s. These both go between 0 and 1. Obviously, if you say nothing's a W jet, then you get a point here. If you say all my jets are W jets, you get a point here. And at the end of the day, you get somewhere a curve connecting one to the other. Okay? And for each method, you can draw such a curve. And in that case, the low for a given signal efficiency, or well, for a given signal efficiency, the lower the background efficiency, the better. Okay, so if you manage to keep, I don't know, 50% of the W jets, you want to keep as little QCD jets as possible. So have a lower epsilon b as, as possible. So that's better. You go better if you're lower. And this is something called the rock curve. 
rock standing for receiver operating characteristic, as far as I remember. Uh, that's a signal treatment thing. So you see these kind of rock curves all over the place when you start discussing target performances. Uh, sometimes instead of doing epsilon b, what people do is 1 over epsilon b, so kind of the rejection factor, like higher is better. People sometimes don't like lower is better. They want higher is better. That's always good. Uh, so you can do this. This would be the rejection factor. And there's 1 minus epsilon b that you can use either, which is essentially the fake tag rate. Uh, sorry, the, 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 your efficiency at rejecting uh, the background. And in this case, that curve would essentially just flip up and down. And in that case, uh, higher is better. So you, yeah, whenever you see a rock curve somewhere in the, uh, in the literature, uh, just make sure you read the vertical axis right. OK? So this is one thing. Uh, there's essentially. Uh, a few other things I'd like to introduce, and so this is really the basic way. One thing I'd like to introduce, there's a few things I'd like to introduce, mostly in the context of future discussions in these lectures. One is, well, essentially the fact that the basic thing people are mostly discussing about is generally performance. And performance, this is an example of performance. Having a rock curve which is as low as possible or as high as possible in this, in this uh, right-hand framework, uh, that's one way of discussing performance. If I have a rock curve which does something like this, this is way better at discriminating between Ws and quarks than, than this. So this is way better than this. But if you manage to, 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 to um, precisely measure all the, uh, back, all, all the, all the um, signal checks, then both are one, so you're never uh, on a lower curve. Because you precisely measure. Oh, you mean you can never reach this exact thing here? Probably. Yeah, probably. So I mean, yeah, so think about it that way. Think about, imagine you know perfectly, you've solved QCD. Mm -hmm. You know that if you have a jet with a given set of constituents, it has a given weight, a given probability to happen for both signal and background, and so the best you can do, you cannot beat that weighting. That's the best you can do. Uh, and another measure of performance which is sometimes used, uh, it, it's essentially some kind of discriminating power. Uh, so the, the typical way you would quantify, if you have a signal in the background, the typical way you would quantify how well you extract your signal is essentially the significance. So another uh, common figure is would be essentially to take the signal divided by the square root of the background and here it could be background plus signal, but that would require a cross-section. So uh, let me just take background, assuming the background is, uh, is dominant here. Uh, so this is the typical way of characterizing a significance. By the way, when, you say that when they say they discovered a Higgs with a five sigma significance, that's this kind of construction, give or take. Uh, so typically one way is you quote the significance of different, different taggers, and the higher significance, the better in terms of uh, extracting a signal on top of, uh, of a statistically fluctuating backgrounds. Main, ne namely, your signal is n sigma above statistical fluctuations of your background. Uh, one thing I have to discuss, and that's not, uh, that's not that trivial. Remember when we discussed jet definitions two weeks ago? I told you at the end of the day, one of the constraints you want in your jet definitions is that there are different ways of viewing an event from finite perturbation theory partons to parton showers, hadronization, detector effects, pilot. The same event can be viewed in different levels of accuracy or different levels of precision. And you want your jets to be essentially coherent between one way or another. You can essentially have the same kind of argument here. And that's something I will call robustness. Uh, one method, one tagger, can actually be applied to different contexts. You can apply this to, I don't know, QCD calculation. You can apply this to, uh, say, I only trust perturbative QCD. Uh, so you can apply it to uh, some fixed order Monte Carlo match with some your preferred modern shower, and that's going to give you your preferred QCD prediction. 
On the other hand, you can apply this to PTI, you can apply this to whatever you have in the detector. Uh, so at the end of the day, you want that if you try to assess your target performance in one case, you do get roughly the same thing in the other case. All right? Uh, one, so this would be, I would say, the discovery potential. Imagine you have a new particle somewhere. The higher the significance, the more likely you are to discover that new particle because the bump is going to be more and more visible. Uh, robustness and see how well you trust your extraction of the properties of this bump. Okay? So to trust your properties of this bump, like signal strength and things like that, you need to be able to characterize this, these, uh, these efficiencies the best way possible. And to characterize this robustness, these efficiencies the best way possible, you're probably going to say, I'm going to use Pythia and try one way or another to understand how, how your modeling is. So at the end of the day, this is generally a robustness against uh, all different views of, of this tiger. And you can view, in this case, robustness against uh, non perturbative effects, for example, hadronization, non length event, maybe pilot. You can view robustness against detector effect If your tiger is changed completely by detector effects, you're going to be in trouble. One typical case, uh, you only have, uh, you don't, well, calorimeters have a discrete size in terms of discretization in the rapidity as in the plane. Uh, if your method, your tiger, relies too much on small angles, you might get into trouble here. Uh, and maybe pileup uh, effects is another, is another example here. Uh, th there's probably also one I can add is modeling effects. And by modeling here, I mean, I don't know. A typical way of assessing this is just to run Pythia and Herwig and try to guess whether if Pythia gives you a curve here and Herwig gives you a curve there, it means you're not quite sure exactly what you're doing. Okay? Uh, and, and so in that case, that's something that has nothing to do with performance. It's more a question of how do you trust your, uh, your tiger. Uh, let me check if there's anything I forget. Uh, yes, yeah, so one way of quantifying this is to say I'm going to run, I don't t take, take the case of detector effects, just for change. Uh, you run something, that's something frequent in case of detector, of uh, an experiment analysis. You have a Monte Carlo sample, say Pythia, and you pass your Monte Carlo sample through a simulation of the detector. So imagine I'm running just Pythia sample and I'm taking a point which is that's my working point, given signal efficiency for a given background efficiency. Uh, after, so that's my tagger. I fix my tagger to give me this performance on Pythia. Then I run things through the detector performance, run all sorts of corrections you want. I don't want to go in too much into the details of how that works. Uh, your point is going to end up somewhere else. At the end of the day, what you want is that this distance be as small as possible. And so one way to quantify this is just to introduce, I don't know, something, uh, let me call it zeta, which would be the difference in signal efficiency divided by the average signal efficiency squared plus the difference in background efficiency divided by the average background efficiency squared. And again, a uh, higher is better, so let me take minus this to the minus one half. Uh, let me call this resilience. So this is a number. So for a given working point, I can compute the performance and the significance. And so hopefully what you want is large performance, so large significance and large resilience, and that's what you try to maximize. Something which gives you huge significance of big discovery potential, and something that's resilient, which means I have zero modeling uncertainty, and I can trust what I do to get some physics number, quantitative physics out of it. So at the end of the day, what you want is large Significance, large performance, and large robustness, and large resilience. Uh, usually, and that's something I'll comment on at many different points, usually there's a trade off between uh, performance, significance, and uh, robustness. and namely resilience.
So usually you sort of have to pick a side. Okay? So the typical way of assessing performance and assessing these tigers, the way that people have used uh, from, I would say, the end of the first decade to 2008 or so up to uh, typically now, is someone proposes a method, you get that method, you're going to test whether, if you want to measure whatever property is coming out of that method, you test that your Monte Carlo is reproducing correctly whatever data you measure. So that means the modeling in terms of modeling usually means uh, running a Monte Carlo generator, part and shower Monte Carlo generator, uh, Pythia Sherpa, Herwig are the typical ones. You check whether Pythia Sherpa and Herwig are correctly reproducing what you measure, and that means okay, my tiger is well modeled. Then I can apply it to, uh, then I can apply it to do some real physics or searches with it. Okay, uh, and then if you have several tigers like that, you would do a rock curve. Again, you either do that using Monte Carlo samples or something else, and you try to pick up the one that. Uh, suits you the best in terms of performance and then again modeling in terms of how well it matches uh, how well you trust it's it's modeling okay so now the interesting part how do that so again I'm going to do W to QQ bar versus I know quark or gluon, and let me just say quark or gluon. Again, assume this. This is either a quark or a gluon. That's uh, a glue quark or a quark one. I don't know. Uh, and I'll trust you to build a BSM model where this exists. Uh, so how do you do that? There's several things. Several. There, there's lots of ways to do this. Now, in in, instead of just, I, I could l just go, uh, I don't know, brute force, and just list you 15 methods that are, can be used to do this. Uh, instead of doing that, what we want first to discuss is what's the physics behind these methods. So in terms of, think about this versus this. What's, what are the main physical differences between a W decaying to QQ bar and uh, you may or may not think about this extra gluon and between the decay of a W and the decay of a QCD particle. So naively, you're just going to say this has a mass of this is a mass of the W. Uh, uh, this is give or take first order. This is a zero mass. This is, you only get mass because you have extra radiation. But otherwise, this is no mass. Uh, that's actually a miserable failure. If you look at the plot say of the, the mass of the jet, again, the clustering gives you a form vector, you just square this form vector to get the mass of the jet, you'd expect something like a W to be here and QCD to get something like that, right? Now, actually, it turns out that QCD tends to have a peak. It's the Sudakov peak that we discussed, uh, that we discussed last week, essentially. It's the same that you would get from, yeah, exactly the Sudakov that we did the calculation of last week. And this tends to give you something like this, where, this would be essentially normalized, but in practice, uh, if you do take into account the cross-section, what you get is a signal which is here and a QCD background which is there in terms of cross-sections, okay? Uh, and this is not the end of the story because if you remember what I erased from the beginning, I told you there's all sorts of dirty things happening in a, in a, in a proton proton collision. What people tend to do with boosted jets is, so remember the angle, is the mass over PT, there's a 1 over square root Z1 minus Z factor, you want to cover quite a broad range in Z. And so to do that, the radius is usually taken in the range, you take a typically large angle, somewhere in the range, uh, open weight to 1 is common, sometimes people go to 1.2 or even 1.5, depending on which, which application you go. So you essentially take fat jets. Uh, You can sometimes trust people to come with fancy names or funny names, I don't know. Fadjets probably being one of them. Uh, and so what happens to these fadjets? 
they extremely sensitive to That was my interlude, for those of you who are not. Initial state radiation. Initial state radiation is one, but initial state radiation is mostly point-like. Th that's not too much what bothers me. What bothers me more is actually, is actually a annulling event. Uh, you get something, a annulling event scale is, say, 1 to 2 GeV times pi r square of 1. You get something like 10-ish 10, 10 GeV of an annulling event in your jet. And what happens, the mass actually scales different than PT, but if you, if you do just, like, I'll try to show you a few distributions and plots better than hand drawn on the blackboard, maybe on the uh, last hour of the last lecture. If you do that, this nice W peak, which would you'd expect be central in W mass, actually comes like something like this. And so your, your idea of saying, I'm just going to measure the mass of the jet, is problematic for two reasons. The first one is that the QCD background is way larger than your signal. And the shape of your signal is completely affected by, uh, by whatever underlying event you have. Pileup would be even worse. There are ways to correct for pileup, so this is why I don't necessarily want to, uh, to go into this. The, the, the peak of the QCD distribution is that we try to the incoming pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this would typically be the log times exponential mm, e minus log square that we, that we had, that we derived last week. So there's, there's a Sudakov exponential decay as log of the m over pt in this case, and then there's a rise because there's a log, the, the standard rise at, the, at small masses. Uh, so this is generally, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, next lecture, which is why. But typically, there's, a, there's the typical Sudakov peak we discussed, we discussed last week, uh, and it happens that depending on the pt of the jet, this peak can actually be exactly at the mass of the w. That depends, that strongly depends on pt. Uh, so, looking at the mass doesn't work. So, in a, in a way, if looking at the mass was sufficient, uh, what I said in the last 45 minutes is useless, because in that case you don't need to go into substructure. You just have the mass of the jet that, that's available without doing anything fancy. Uh, turns out it's not enough. So, there's three typical concepts that you want to use in substructure. Two are directly related to how these two systems are different. The third one, uh, I'm going to give it to you now because I don't expect, uh, well, I've already given the answer essentially. The third one is essentially trying to bring these back here. So the third one is essentially reduce uh, sensitivity To uh, say mostly the underlying events, pileup is sort of uh, is sort of the same the same story, and you know if you have a jet, the underlying event is essentially going to be soft particles everywhere in your jet, so not necessarily close to the center of your jet. So what you want to do here by saying you want to reduce sensitivity to underlying event, this means sensitivity to soft particles at large angle. Okay. Uh, large here means large. Always may mean small and large. It's in a log logarithmic sense. Okay. QCD typically is d theta over theta. So a finite angle is is always considered as large. Uh, and that's something called grooming. So this is there's a bunch of these techniques which are called grooming techniques. And the goal of these gr so-called grooming techniques is generally to limit these effects here. That's a common word in the, in the substructural literature. Now, the other two are directly related to these differences. Can anyone give me one difference between, uh, I don't know, one is a difference between this splitting and that splitting. The other one is a difference between that object and that object. Decay rate. The decay is different. So imagine the decay here is a fraction z here and 1 minus z there, z here and 1 minus z there. You can just measure the probability of decay. That's essentially the splitting function, right? The splitting function p of z for a w and the splitting function for quark and gluons. Uh, how does it behave when there's a function of z here? That everyone should know. <laughs> 
this one typically is a subdivergence. So most of the gluons emitted from the quark and gluon, most of these gluons are just going to be soft. Okay? Why in the case of a W, this splitting is more or less constant. And again, constant by mean it's a polynomial in Z, that's a finite polynomial in Z on top of this, but give or take, this has a soft divergence, this doesn't. Okay? And so this tells you that there's no method one. Yeah, so essentially this tells you that these two objects have a large PT, carry a large fraction of PT, so you have two hard guys in here. Well, in this case, you have a hard guy and soft guys. So in that case, this means this guy is going to, well, this guy is going to have one hard core. And people sometimes use the name prong instead of core. And this guy would have two hard cores. So the basic first uh, idea is find you want to find a method which is able to identify hard cores inside your jet. Because if you have more than one hard core, it means it's likely going to come from W. If you have a single hard core, it's likely to come from one of these guys. Second difference, what's the difference between a W and a quark gluon? Charge. Charge. Not even, and I'm not talking about electric charge here, I'm talking about QCD charge. This doesn't emit gluons. This does. Okay? So the second method is this is related to the fact that this is coronless while this is colored. And what does it mean? It means essentially that this is not going to, it means that these and these are going to radiate differently. In the sense that the Q and Q bar are going to radiate, those are charged under QCD, so you're going to have softish radiation coming from these two guys, but if the angle here is say some angle theta, essentially this radiation here is within an angle theta around this quark and antiquark. That's, that's angular ordering. I think that's sort of related to what, that's the same spirit as what, Carlos, what you were saying in the break. That, uh, that it's, it's an angle and not a lifetime, but that's the idea. The fact that this is coronless is the impact that there's a region of the phase space namely soft and large angle, which is not populated by the W. Uh, it's not exactly the same as the, the fact that it has a finite decay time, but it's, uh, it's, it's the same similar in spirit. While in this case, uh, you'll have, while you have radiation from these guys at angles smaller than this decay angle, you also have soft radiation from the quark congruent here. So the pattern The pattern uh, separate radiation pattern, and by radiation pattern here, you mostly mean radiation pattern that's mostly for soft gluons at large angle. So essentially, by large here, I mean angles larger and the decay angle of the W2 quarks. And this is, so most, uh, probably 90% of the methods now fall in one of these three categories. Now, these are not hard, there's, there's no hard boundaries between these categories. For example, if you think about a method that's able to find hard prongs, finding hard stuff typically means neglecting soft yeah. stuff, okay? And if you neglect soft stuff, that means that most of the methods that do work as prong finders are also good grooming methods, because by definition, finding hard stuff is removing soft. So something which is good in this case is usually good in that case as well. And uh, I'll merge actually both of them in, the, in, in what's coming up. Uh, similarly, using, well, similarly, if you use the fact that the soft and large angle is different, uh, this is intention with this. 
If I tell you these methods do remove things which are soft and large angle, it means I can no, long, no longer use them to, use, to build my discriminant. And so there's a sort of a tension between these two, and that's exactly an example of this trade-off here. If you want resilience, you want to be as little sensitive to, say, non perturbative effects or modeling, and annoying event and pi up are definitely both parts of your modeling and your non perturbative effects. And in this case, if you want to reduce or increase your robustness, you probably have to sacrifice a bit of performance. So this is a, a very typical example of what I mean by there's a trade-off between, uh, between these two things. OK? So I, I'm going to describe methods now. I'm going to spend the last, uh, say, 20-something-ish minutes to give you a list of methods. Uh, I'll try to keep that list, I don't know, there's always, a tr here there's a trade-off again, another trade-off, between uh, boring you with a long list of methods, of linear methods, and t linear and tasteless, a priori tasteless methods, uh, and, and trying to give you a little bit more uh, sense of what's going on. So I'll try, so keep in mind, uh, let me move this one up. I don't know. So you keep these, these categories uh, in mind. Uh, so first, finding uh, n prongs. So finding prongs is usually done using clustering. Why? Because clustering gives you a way to take a jet breaking that jet into small chunks this is trivial right you just there's, there's a very simple way to do that you take your anti kt jet you take all the particles in your anti kt jet with a radius somewhere between 0.8 and say, let me take one as a give or take number for this for this initial jet and you're going to break it down in smaller you redo another clustering KT Cambridge and TKT with a radius around 0 0.3, 0 0.2, something like that. And this gives you a bunch of subjects. So you have subjects. So yeah, th the first method is recluster with typically here you'd use either KT or Cambridge Aachen. At some point I will discuss why one versus one or the other. Uh, but not now, with some r sub smaller than r, and that gives you a bunch of subjects. Now you need to, do one to decide what you do with these subjects, okay? One thing you can do is just say keep n some fixed number of hard Hardest here means in terms of PT subjects. That's one method. The other one would say keep subjects with PT bigger than some fraction of your original PT jet. So you break things into chunks. I'm going to keep everything which is at least 5% of the original PT. Removing the stuff, one keeping the hard one. Okay, that's one method to find hard prongs. Uh, this method here is called filtering. This method here is called trimming. Yeah, fancy names. Trimming is actually still in use by the Atlas collaboration today. And that's not care, that's keep. Okay? Two. There you go. You have your methods. Any questions about those? If you apply this to the um, non-WJ, surely 
Yeah, oh, so what happens if you do this is your W guy, which was like this, I'm trying to see if I can find a little bit of color here. So imagine your W guy was originally like this. Uh, you're going to remove, this is going to remove most of the underlying event. I'm thinking about this as a, as, as a groomer in this context. So this means that after this, you're going to retain, uh, that's exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. You're going to retain a, a peak much narrower. So this removes the thing that was smearing and pushing your peak upwards in mass. So this actually gives you a resolution on the W, on your signal. Now, if the QCD was something like that, one of the effects would actually be to reduce this to something like this. Uh, part of the idea is that you're not only removing the annoying event, you're also removing, as you say, you're removing all of the soft radiation and so your mass drastically decreases. So uh, either you take my word on it that it does this, or you come back next week because we're actually going to calculate how this solid distribution differs from the dashed one. That's part of next week's lecture. But remember, n doesn't play a role, so it should be n. No, no, in this case, this, it's two different methods. That's one method filtering, one method trimming. I see. Uh, Uh, to my knowledge, filtering has not been used in, uh, in any practical application so far. Uh, there's, there's reason why it hadn't, it has not, and there are reasons to consider it again now. Uh, yeah, but that's, uh, if you want to understand better filtering, I can, uh, okay. I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's reason. I think it was historically the first one. Uh, that was part of the Higgs to BB bar paper by uh, John Butterworth, Gavin Salam, Mathieu Rubin, and Adam Davison. So that's one method. Well, that's two methods. The next method is, uh, again, relying on clusterings. That's one approach. So the next method is going to say recluster with Kemja. So, uh, anytime. I'm going to take a radius which is uh, as big as you want. Take the radius to a thousand. You replace the what? Cambridge Aachen. That's the Cambridge Aachen algorithm. The Cambridge Aachen. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah. So that's the yeah. distance. Cambridge Aachen is just delta r i j, which is delta phi delta y i j squared plus delta phi i j squared. So this essentially clustered objects in distance, in terms of Euclidean distance in the, uh, in the rapidity azimuthal plane, azimuthal angle plane. Uh, I'm taking the radius big enough so that all my constituents are reclustered in a single new jet, if you wish. So the second step is to undo the last step of the clustering. So imagine I have an object. Okay, uh, clustering is going to probably do something like this, 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 and this. Uh, let me add another one here, okay, and this. What you're going to do is undo the last one. So from this jet, you're going to go into something which is undoing this guy. Okay, so this is subject number one, this is subject number two, and this is my original jet, okay? And so this last step is essentially just giving you j into j1 and j2. And let me just assume pt1 is bigger than pt2. So pt1 is the hard one and pt2 is a, is a soft one. You want to find hard guys. So what you're going to do is to say if z, which is pt2 divided by pt1 plus pt2, so you're literally going to say this is z, this is 1 minus z. If z is bigger than z cut, you stop. And if you stop, that means if z is bigger than z cut, it means these two guys are hard, hard enough. By hard, that's that's 
What you mean by hard is harder than Z curve. <coughs> and I found two hard guys in my jet. Otherwise, set j equals j1 and repeat. So otherwise, you just discard this. And you repeat this procedure with the 1 minus z1. So you're going to undo, in that case, this guy into this and that. Okay, you remove this guy. So the fact that you remove this guy means that you have a property, which means that you remove things which are soft or large angle. And the fact that you explicitly impose a condition of having some hard stuff in here means you're satisfying category 1 up here. Okay? And so this is the uh, modified mass drop tagger. Uh, I'll refer to as MMDT in what follows. Uh, that's really one of the worst naming convention in the whole field. Uh, let me just give you a few words on this. Modified because there was a measure of tiger before. And the measure of tiger before didn't use exactly this constraint and used an extra constraint. The extra constraint was actually a constraint on the mass drop. So not only did I did modify it just to say it's going to be, it's not the same as the previous version, but they removed the mass drop condition and kept the mass drop name. So, okay. Uh, all right, uh, give or take. That's the modified mass drop tagger, and that's still uh, uh, probably one of the most, if not that's probably the most frequent subtracker tool used today. Um, I'm going to discuss this over and over again. All techniques similar to this based on the Cambridge clustering tree in the, in the future. Of, w one of the reasons of using Cambridge is actually easy. Imagine you want to get a W, okay? Uh, so think about having a W splitting into Q Q bar. You get some splitting at small angles, smaller than this. But in terms of this context, you'll get all sorts of underlying event activity flying around. So what you're going to do is essentially just all these soft things are large angles are going to happen in the clustering. Remember, clustering is done by geometric distance. So you're first going to cluster these guys, cluster these two guys together, and then add in everything which is outside. So if you do this by undoing this, all this soft stuff at large angle is just going to be removed until your typical declustering is going to reach the W to QQ bar. So if you wish, it's a, it's a way to reach the, the W to QQ bar without introducing this parameter here. So it's a dynamical way of, of auto-focusing the, uh, the procedure directly to the relevant scale in the problem, which is a QQR uh, DK angle. All right? If so if you do that for different Z-cut and then you look at Z-cut distribution, then it will be better. We have a more symmetric distribution in Z-cut for a W than for a So one thing, you can, one thing you can do is, is you can treat Z cut as a free parameter. Exactly. And what you can do is build a rock curve where you do vary Z cut. If you take Z cut to zero, you get one, you, you keep everything. If you take Z cut to one or one half in this case, you get nothing. And by varying Z cut, you interpolate between the two. So typical values of Z cut are taken usually like 0.1. Uh, there's an alternative to this, which is replace this condition by Z equals PT2 over PT1 plus PT2 larger than, so what you want to do in, in the other case is adjust this curve as a function of the angle, saying for larger angles I want to get harder than for low angles. And so what you're going to do is say Z cut times uh, theta over R, just to make it dimensionless, to some power beta. So beta equals zero gives back an MDT, uh, any other beta gives something different, and that's something called soft drop. 
beware that in the literature people, oh well, people 99% of the time say they're using soft drop, why are they using beta equals zero? So what they're really using is actually the modified nice drop tiger, but... Uh, okay, so, yeah. we do, so we do the same, right? Sorry? <laughs> we do the same. We, everyone does it. Uh, <laughs> it's fine as long as you don't forget to cite the original paper. And uh, I don't care because I'm in the subgroup paper and not the modified mass group, but some of my close collaborators are. And so I'd like to keep them as collaborators. Uh, <laughs> well, there's actually one. See one about Zadi is on both papers. Uh, All right, any questions so far? So next week, we're actually essentially going to compute the jet mass distribution in QCD, uh, leading logs, so we'll keep things simple, for uh, trimming mass drop and soft drop and see exactly how these, this question about solid versus dashed lines there. Uh, so far, so good. I've covered a fraction of what I wanted to say. Uh, so. The next thing is discussing uh, radiation constraints. And during, well, we already discussed radiation constraint once in this lecture. Do you remember what we discussed? We already discussed one quantity which was meant as a radiation constraint. Haha, that was one of the very first thing I did. First. Thrust does exactly that. It tries to measure how radiation is distributed in the vent. So most of these radiation constraints are essentially taking the same kind of approach. So they're using uh, jet shapes. So instead of thinking event, event shapes defined on the entire event like you would do in E plus C minus to try to constrain radiation in E plus C minus, you just do apply that shape to one single jet isolated. So it's a jet shape. And there's a bunch of there's a bunch of them. I'll just list them. At least a few, the common ones, and discuss them as we go along. So the first one is angularities. Uh, I'll probably introduce generalized angularities. Uh, here you can define lambda. And I need two exponents, let's say beta and two parameters, beta and kappa. You're going to make a sum over all the particles in the jet. You said i to the parameter kappa times the distance between i and the jet to a parameter beta. And if you remember thrust, thrust was essentially a scalar product between two objects. So thrust is essentially theta squared. Scalar product is one minus cos theta, which is theta squared. So thrust is actually beta equals two. You can define, for those who know a bit of, of uh, E plus C e minus collision, the things like broadening would be K or KT distributions would be beta equals one in this context. So this is, and angularities have been defined before in E plus C e minus collisions as well, uh, with signs and cos appropriate to make it uh, even, even uh, more friendly. Uh, so Z in this case, I'm going to use the same Z everywhere. Z i is just P T i divided by the sum of P T i's. Is the fraction of the P T carried by particle i. Uh, any value of kappa I should prefer? There's clearly one value of kappa you want to take and not the others. Why? One. Why? If you take anything different from one, you're either soft or collinear unsafe. Typically collinear unsafe, because imagine you do take Z, which is anything, kappa, anything from one. Imagine you just have something like this. Take the extreme case, kappa equals zero, right? Uh, this is just going to be the angle here. You just split this collinearly. You get twice the angle here, plus zero. So collinear splitting modifies your, your your value. And actually, this is the case for any value of kappa different from 1. So uh, for the sake of infrared linear safety, I'll stay with kappa equals 1. 
you can actually write down kind of uh, renormalization group equations for kappa different from one if you uh, if you know what you're doing. So there, there there are ways to massage things around and try to uh, essentially what if, what happens if you, if you're not infrared and are safe at some point you'll hit non perturbative region and so you essentially say this is a distribution non perturbative region and I'm going to find an evolution equation towards uh, in this case from so small to large angles. Uh, so there are ways to deal with this. And there are actually constraints in uh, some experiments and analysis which use variables close to what happens with kappa equals 2 or 0. Kappa equals 0 is essentially, take kappa equals 0, beta equals 0, that's just multiplicity. Okay, that's a simple thing. Multiplicity is something that is uh, used in, uh, in, in many contexts. And you easily understand why multiplicity works. Uh, if you take W versus quark or gluon, you expect the W to have way less particles because it doesn't have radiation at large angles. You do expect multiplicity to be a good discriminant. Uh, same thing if you do quark versus gluon. Gluon radiates more than quark, so you'd expect multiplicity to be higher in gluons than quarks. So multiplicity is a good discriminant, except it's infrared linear and safe. And these angularities are typically used in, in quark versus gluon discrimination. And I'll discuss that at some point uh, next week as well. So this essentially measures the radiation around the jet axis. So this would be typically fine for quark and gluons because you have your leading quote unquote quark or gluon with radiation around, and you quantify that radiation around. Now, what you can do is extend this. I'll say something to something all ends in which is going to define axes. I'm going to define n axis a1 and n. I'll specify that in a second. And you're going to define tau n as being the sum over i within the jet as zi. Uh, you can do zi or pti. You can normalize it or not. Let me do zi here. Times the minimum of theta i a1 theta i a n, and again to some power beta, so it's tau n beta. So essentially you're defining prefer, preferred directions, n preferred directions, and you're measuring, you're summing essentially the radiation around these n directions. Okay. Uh, so take the case of n equals 2, the typical case is you would have your W decaying to Q Q bar, this would be your axis 1, this would be your axis 2, and you'd expect radiation to be centered around this with no radiation at large angles. And so in this case, you'd expect this to be bigger in a QCD event which has radiation at large angles compared to the W case where radiation is constrained around, around your two axes here. Okay? Now, if you try to measure tau 1, tau 1 is essentially the same as angularity, your axis would be something like the axis of your jet, and so you get a large value of tau 1 because of this QQ bar spinning. So the idea in this case is that if you have an object with n prongs and hard prongs, you'll get tau 1 to tau n minus 1, which are, well, yeah, sorry, tau, tau 1 to tau n, which is large, and tau n plus 1, small. So if you want to separate n prone from n minus 1, uh, you're going to take the ratio tau n over tau n minus 1. So the ratio tau 2 divided by tau 1 would be a good tau 2 1, would be a good W tiger. So 3, 2 would be a good top tagger, and so on and so forth. So now how you need to choose the axis, that's a different story. There's essentially, well, there's a bunch of methods to do this. One method is actually to go back to clustering. You do cluster your jet, you decluster your jet into, you undo like something like the Cambridge algorithm or the KT algorithm. You undo your clustering until you find n axis. There's another method which you could actually define your axis as the set of axes which minimizes this. This is a function of n variables, your axis, and there's a minimum in this space of axes. 
define this. Uh, so the, these are choices. Uh, for this reason, the fact that you do have to specify axes, many people didn't like that. And so they came up with another approach. Uh, ah, I need space. The other approach is called energy correlation functions. Energy correlation functions. And in that case, uh, let me do that incrementally. You will define E2 as being the sum uh, over I in J. I'll assume the in J explicit now. Zi, Zj, I in J in J. Zi, Zj, theta, Ij to some power. It's again the data. So instead of measuring distances with respect to axes, the J axis in this case, I'm just going to measure particles distance between particles. So think about having a hard guy follow a hard guy accompanied by many soft guys. Uh, essentially, one of the z is going to be the hard guy in here, and this angle is going to be the same as the angle with respect to the z. So e two is actually the same as angularities in the limit of a hard guy accompanied by soft. Then you can expand this. E three would be a sum over i j k z i z j z k times theta i j to the beta theta i k to the beta theta j k to the beta, and that would be the equivalent of two of two j minus. <coughs> isn't that, um, for the n problem, it shouldn't be t one up to t n minus one larger than t n small. Uh, oh, we're thinking about two. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, right. That's actually this is slightly different from tau two. Uh, we won't have the time to cover this in, uh, in these lectures. You can actually well, one thing that people get bothered at some point is the fact that you have a very specific combination of angles, so they started building new ones. Uh, you can extend this to e4, e5, but there's no point. They introduce something like 2e3, which is the sum or i smaller than j smaller than k, z i, z j, z k, times the minimum of theta i j to the beta, theta i k to the beta, theta i j to the beta, theta j k to the beta, theta i k to the j k. So instead of building something out of three angles, you build something out of two angles. And you could do define one E3 when you take the minimum of any, any angle, okay? Uh, the reason I won't introduce these two is because you can introduce C2, which is uh, E3 over E2 squared. You can introduce D2, which is E3 over E2 cubed. And you can introduce N2, which is one, or two, E3 over E2 squared. And all these are actually good W types. Uh, there's actually a reason to uh, choose this one over this one. And there's small differences. Actually, this one is much closer to my subjection S than, than E3. Sorry. So the reason I want to say that is that for most of the run two analysis, W tagging is done by CMS using the modifying mass of Tiger or some growth with variable equals zero, plus, and that depends, they initially use tau two one and then move to N2. And Atlas has essentially used trimming plus D2. So if you look at the papers I was mentioning before about tagging this dibose in excess, this is a method that has been used. So that now, when you see these tigers, that's essentially what they, what they use. Uh, I'm running out of time, so let me see. I've mentioned all I wanted to say about... Uh, and the choice depends on what on the experiment? The, the, the oh, the choice depends on lots of things. Uh, mostly, uh, it's mostly, again, back to this trade-off between performance and resilience. Uh, this tends to be a bit more performant than this one. This tends to be a bit more resilient than this one. Uh, 
uh, there, there's, there's details, there's really details. Sensitivity to find out is one of them. Uh, another one is what do you use to compute those you want. So I, I told you initially this is what happens. Now, the minute you have this guy into the game, the question is, belonging, well, belonging to Jet, what does it mean? Does it belong to the Jet after you've run this? So only the two hard problems? Or does it belong to the full Jet? And again, full Jet means more integrating power, but more sensitivity to knowing it out. And so I think, as far as I remember, CMS switch. This was computed in the full jet. This was computed in the, uh, the boom jet. So again, that, that, there, there's lots of discussions like that. I can uh, maybe come back to this if I have a chance to discuss these guys in more detail. I don't know yet. Maybe next week or two weeks from now. So there's two remarks I want to do, I want to mention before before closing this. The first one is indeed at the end of the day you want to combine this. The, there are two genuine different physics ideas. One is fine hardcore. The other one. This is really my point one and point two. Uh, and point one slightly cover, covers point three. So you really want to make a combination. This combination is logic. That, that generally makes sense. You want something that exploits both of your physical properties. Uh, these are the main things which are used. There's devil, devil lying many details here, like what I just said. Uh, the last thing is there's a few things I haven't uh, discussed. Other tools, uh, shower little instructions, one of them. I haven't covered the case of top. If you want to do top, you need to find three hard problems. Essentially what you do, there's several methods to do that, and again, the details do vary. What you will do is mostly run this guy twice. So you run it once, that gives you two problems. You run it a second time of each of the two problems, that's, give you, that's giving you up to four problems. Okay? And then you essentially make a kinematic cut, like that. Like two of these branches need to be to match the W because you know it's stuck to W to, uh, to something. Uh, and so you made a cut to select three prongs out of the four based on uh, how they match with W kinematics. And so that's the basic guideline for top, top the case. There's tools like the head top tiger, which does way more, especially in recent incarnations. Uh, the CMS top tiger does something like that. Johns Hopkins top tiger does something like that. That's the common names in the literature, which do something along those lines. And then you can combine this with a gun in Dell 3 too, to get again this double uh, conceptual concept. Uh, I think this is about all I wanted to say. Uh, I'll talk at some point, probably not next week, but two weeks from now. This has essentially been changed uh, by machine learning approaches. And so I'll discuss that not next week, but two weeks from now. Where I essentially, two weeks from now, so my game next week is trying to discuss how these guys, at least these guys, and angularities, how angularity behaves in terms of form versus gluon. I'll talk about a different method for form gluon. How these guys behave in terms of W tagging. I probably won't have the time to cover these. Probably. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And two weeks from now, I'll essentially discuss lots of details. How you can do precision physics with these kinds of guys, how you can do machine learning, how you can try to actually do better, have broader views of the jet than this, and do machine learning with this as well, and do all sorts of precision measurements and fun. So is there any question on this one? As a homework, think about why Cambridge in this case. Think about why you want to use Cambridge in this case. And in terms, again, of uh, not a clustering question, uh, is there a simple, what clustering algorithm, I'll tell you to define the axis here, you can use KT, Cambridge, whatever. Uh, for a given beta, what's the preferred algorithm? With that, you have things to do for next week. Thanks. Okay. Three.